Good morning. Feels like ages ago that I was standing, where Nina was standing now, introducing a keynote speaker. For pretty much 10 years, I've refused to give a talk right here because I've been part of the organizing team. Someone tricked me into standing up, getting up early this morning. <laughs> so, I'm going to talk to you about open source, um, essentially from a user's perspective. For 15 years, I've spent time with open source communities, mostly at the Apache ecosystem, and what I've seen there is how these projects manage to build bridges, bridges across time zones, geographies, um, countries, but also organizations. What I would like to explain to you is how to become a part of this community and how to draw your um, team into a bigger open source ecosystem. Before I do that, we've got a couple empty rows here. If you are an M a Apache Software Foundation member, can you please come up to me so that you can correct me? Uber's sitting right there, I see you. <laughs> can you come here, please? <laughs> I've seen Neil somewhere up there. <laughs> I see you. <laughs> Thank you, Nick, for coming. <laughs> Doesn't matter, first or second. So you can shout at me if I'm telling bullshit. <laughs> Thank you. OK, the entire slide deck isn't only born from my inspiration. It's based on an Apache Way presentation that was given before by many other people. Many of these mentioned up there. Thank you for the inspiration. So for those of you who haven't heard about my name before, I'm a open source strategist at Europace, which is a company here in Berlin in the financial sector. I'm also a member of the Apache Software Foundation. I happen to be co-founder of this very conference, which feels awkward to say right here. Essentially, the idea was that I don't like flying in planes so much. So I prefer to have you come here so that I can come to a conference with public trans transit or a bicycle. I'm also a co-founder of Fast Backstage, which deals with everything economics, um, governance, legal of open source projects. Going to happen again, likely later this year. Um, talk to these people. So. What's my journey, what's my user journey in open source? My first email to an open source project that went out, I believe, in 2002, maybe 2003. You can search with your favorite search engine if you still find it. I was still a very young student when I sent it. After that, I joined a research group which was dealing with text mining, with link mining, here at HU Berlin. What I wanted to do was to analyze the web structure to figure out if um, web pages in the social media space, which back then still were called weblogs and not Facebook, were differently linked between each other than the regular web. For that, I needed a search engine and a crawler. That was Apache Nudge. Well, back then, it was hosted on SourceForge. While I was using Nudge, it moved from SourceForge to the incubator, from the incubator to a top-level well, sub-project of Apache Lucene. Every single time these moves happened, my inbox got flooded again. And I was like, what are those people doing? What helped, though, was that I joined these mailing lists. I got my questions ans answered. I started answering questions of other people, and I got valuable input. While I got this input, I also asked how to cite this project in a research publication. One of the founders of, of Apache Nudge came back to me and said to me, hey, this is how you can cite it. And say hi to your advisor, because the founder of that project thought that I'm just a student. Same thing happened to me afterwards. I was communicating with people at eye level, mistaking many people in C-level um, positions, in senior research positions. It's just your neighbor from across the street. 
Luckily, nobody ever took offense with me mistaking them for, some, them for something that they were not. What happened when I left research was that I stayed subscribed. At some point, Grant Ingersoll posted an email on the Lucene mailing list asking whether there should be some Apache text mining project out there. I reached out. He came back to me that there's like four, five, six people interested in it. Half a year later, Apache Mahout was born, which was um, machine learning, classification, clustering, and recommender systems at scale. Now, tired of flying to conferences, this is a conference that I created. Half a year later, someone made me a member of the foundation, and I'm like, what? What happened? Me? I believe this happened to a few other people as well. Now, through, throughout um, the, my entire time at Apache, what I found fascinating is the independence that these projects have of single entities. There's always multiple people, multiple organizations involved that keeps the project alive. And that's something that I'm looking for when I'm looking at open source projects today. Now, I want you to wake up. Don't worry, I'm not going to make anyone else come to the front. Um, please raise your hand if you run your systems based on a vanilla upstream project release. One? Really, just one, two, three? Okay. Anyone running based on a vendor's um, packaged release? You're all sleeping, aren't you? <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not making you come to the front. Um, how many vendors do we have in the audience that have based their um, offerings on open source? Some more, okay. Okay, now I really want to see hands. How many of you do contribute after hours? For any definition of after hours. <laughs> how many of you contribute occasionally as part of your job? Okay, half. More than half. How, how many contribute full time? Third, maybe fourth, fifth. Okay. So, why should you care? Well, if you build your business on top of an, a project, then there are a few questions that you want to answer before building your, a strong dependency on that project. You want to know how these projects deal with security issues. You want to understand who is behind the project and who's driving it. You want to know what happens if this entity fails to continue, say, if this one company runs out of funding or if this one person runs out of funding. You also want to understand how project decisions are being made if there's like one person driving the decision, or if you can become part of this decision-making process. And this is what this talk essentially is all about. How do these projects run? Now, you've heard already that my background is a strong Apache background, so this isn't really a talk about a user's perspective on open source in general, but really on the Apache Software Foundation's version of open source. Now, what does it mean to be, to be open source? If you follow Twitter, there's quite some discussion going on about the term open source. For me personally, it means it has to be A, under an open source initiative approved license, so that it's open source by the license. But to me, coming from Apache, it also means an open development process. That means open roadmap creation, open architecture, architecture decisions, plus open design documents, plus a process where I can go and participate. Now, who's part of this community making these decisions? In my personal experience, it starts with the users. So this was everyone here in the room. Now, if you've been in the Lucene community for long enough and you've been digging through the wiki for long enough, you will run across this citation 
which is Yonex law of patches, a half-baked patch in Jira with no documentation, no tests, and no backwards compatibility is better than no patch at all. Referring back to my first experience with Apache Nudge, of course I made some modifications dealing with writables back then in the so-called Nudge distributed file system. I never contributed it back. I wanted to have it perfect. I wanted to have it polished. I wanted to have it such that it just works, except it never went out. So this is where I learned that it's better to share your progress very early on, even if it feels awkward, even if you're not confident with that, people around you will help you get it further. With your first patch, with your, so you will be counted as a project contributor. At Apache Mahout, a friend of mine once told me that in order to become a committer, what it, he did was to flood the project with patches and with contributions. So that over time, committers were just like, come on, I don't want to review yet another patch. Give him write access and go ahead. If it's, so for some projects, that's the same level, actually, being a committer and a PMC member. But what do you get if you st stick, stick around for long enough? You are the one who makes the decision who else to pull in. If you, again, stick around for long enough, do something cross-foundational, people will nominate you as a member of the Apache Software Foundation. If peop people come to me and tell me, hey, I want to be a member, what should I do? What, I'd ha what I first ask them is, do you really want to be a member? You get to read another two mailing lists with high traffic. Is that really what you want? So what do you get to do as a member? Of course, you become part of that foundation. You may be elected as a board of directors. Remember, you had another mailing list to read and follow. Plus, you can vote who becomes a director. What's the task of these directors? Why is directorship between PMC and membership? They are the ones um, providing oversight over the projects. What's this, fu this funny foundation there for? It's there to serve the projects, essentially providing services like infrastructure, press, etc., through um, officers and committees. However, everything, all of that, starts with a user's need turned into a contribution. Now, interestingly enough, that's baked deep into the history of the Apache Foundation, actually. I still bump randomly into people, like this weekend, for instance, when going shopping, who talk to me like, wait a minute, you're wearing a Fostem t-shirt, what's your relation to open source? And I'm like, I'm part of the Apache Software Foundation, and they go like, yeah, this web server. No. Not really, <laughs> but still the history. So the, where this foundation comes from is that there were a bunch of people relying on a web server for production use, except that the person who wanted to develop it at some point didn't have the time and resources to do so anymore. So they banded together, um, continuing the development of a patchy web server. What you see, if you look at that, is that those whole contributions, they weren't altruistic at all. They were very self-serving. They had this web server in production. They wanted it to be fast, performant, secure. So they were making these contributions, not because they had a lot of time left. They didn't do so because they wanted to make the world a better place. They wanted to get a job done. In order for that to work, even then, people were coming from different organizations. What they built was what someone once called the Switzerland of open source. What they mean with that is a neutral place for people to collaborate. Where independently of your affiliation, independently of your history, you can collaborate to bring your project forward. So how does it work? Let's get some simple issues to get started. Start with copyright, patenting, trademarks. Why are the legal aspects important for downstream users? Think about projects pulling in dependencies. You want your projects that you rely on to be 
clear of any license infringements. You want it to be um, clean. Think about contributions coming from corporations. You want to make sure that it's OK for these people to make that contribution. Think about patent issues. What else is there? There's trademark issues. As a trade downstream user, what I want is that if I'm downloading a duck, it's actually the duck that I'm looking for. So I want to make sure that the project trademark is being used such that it's not confusing for my downstream users. But I also want to make sure that my project name doesn't infringe on existing project names. Otherwise, I'm going to have to rename over and over and over, and my user doesn't know where the project went. OK, so far for simple issues. What about slightly more messy, complex issues called project governance? Some things that we do today and tomorrow here as well. Apache says community over code. Someone once translated that as a project without people is a dead project, or at least one that's very deep asleep. Which kind of community are we talking about? Everyone here in the room. Not only commuters, not only the ones sitting here in the front row, but like everyone here. Where do we find you? We find you on social media, we find you on the Stack Overflow. But don't be surprised if speak, people speak up and try to channel discussions back to the official project um, communication channels. What are those? Still mailing lists. So you're still higher bandwidth than what you get on Twitter. So don't be afraid to join an official project channel, to speak up there, to ask your questions there. I still remember that 15 years ago, that felt very awkward to me. What happened was that people were very friendly and were answering. So often there's paid support available from third parties. My experience is that it's still helpful to remain in the loop of the original projects. Even if you won't get vendor-specific questions answered there, people will be able to help you out with more generic questions. But more importantly, just from watching the discussions, you will see which issues people run into, and you will uh, to avoid running into the same problems and avoid making the same mistakes. And trust me, over time, you can't help but answer questions in there and become involved. Now, where does communication happen? Direct communication works. So this is a picture taken at Berlin Buzzwords. I don't know, it was at Urania, so maybe second or third edition. It's high bandwidth. You see the faces. You see gestures being made. You typically realize when someone's being sarcastic, except that this kind of communication doesn't scale. As much as I would like to have everyone in Berlin all of, like every month and every day in the year, that won't happen. So we will have to rely on asynchronous communication. So there's a rule at Apache which says, if it didn't happen on the mailing list, it didn't happen. Does that mean that Berlin buzzwords doesn't happen? Clearly not. People are chatting here. They are hacking here. We've had hackathons happen here for specific projects. All this rule says is that if you make an important decision, you have to take it back to the mailing list, because not everyone can make the flight here and can make the time to be here, so that they can participate in the decision-making process. Now, what do they mean with mailing lists? It's not the scary CC lists that you have in some companies. It's one mailing list where everything you write to is archived, you can go back to 1995 for the HTTPD mailing list and still read where everything is coming from. All of that is searchable with a Lucene-based search engine. Someone's smiling there. <laughs> Plus, all those links are stable, so you can link down to the specific conversation. You can reference the conversation in today's communication, and this link will remain stable. What does it look like? There's one user list, there's one dev list, all of that is public. Like every decision. 
My personal checklist as a user, but also as a developer, is documentation public, both developer documentation and user documentation. Is roadmap planning public? Is there some public user support? Are the architecture decisions being made in public? Now, if everything is public, everyone can get involved. And everyone has to be involved. Does it take ages? Not quite so. So, for import, so you, you, you can make decisions by something called lazy consensus and avoid dragging decisions forever. What that means is you say, I'm going to make change X within the next two days unless someone speaks up. You wait for the two days, nothing happens, you go, go forward. You don't have to wait for explicit approval. If you go to mailing lists, you will see a plus one, minus one, zero, what have you. So it's just people voting on decisions, sometimes explicitly in a vote thread, sometimes even implicitly, people just posting plus one, minus one. If you're interested, you can go to the Apache.org website. There are even clear rules on how to vote, and there are rules on whether something is a majority decision or if there can be hard vetoes. Now, I told you that everything is public, right? Except when it's not. When a project is discussing about whether Nick should get commit right, that's not going to be public. Google won't be able to surface this discussion. This happens on a private list. What does private mean? It's private to the project. Who else can see it? Directors of the foundation can see it. And members of the foundation can see it. That's like 700 people. So much for true privacy. That's something you should keep in mind when posting something to a private list. Something else. Those who do the work are the ones who take the decisions. It's kind of like a scratch your own itch kind of thingy. So if you want to have something done, it's better to volunteer to help with getting it done. If you come to a project as someone just requesting a new feature because that's what you want, people tend to ask you, can you help out? Taken to the extreme, before doing Berlin buzzwords, like, oh my gosh, that's 11, 12 years ago, I was running a Hadoop meetup here in Berlin. Like meetups go, Everyone was complaining, like I felt like everyone was complaining. It's the wrong time, it's the wrong place, it's the wrong date. Okay, you complain, you're the one to be the next first speaker, and then you set the date and time. That's how I found speakers. Okay, what does that mean? What are those contributions? This could be a contribution. What else? It doesn't have to be code only. It could be conference organization, could be meetup organization, could be helping with the, keeping the issue tracker clean, could be user support, could be press work, could be helping with the fixing security issues. Everything that contributes to the success of the project. So essentially, contributions are more than just source code. What do you get for a contribution? I've learned that chocolate works well for bribery. Some of you, I don't know if Sunil is here, but some of you may have received chocolate from me in the past. I once was offered iTunes vouchers, except I don't use iTunes. What works better is a public qualified thank you. What do I mean by public qualified thank you? Qualified meaning thank you for X because it helped me do Y better because this is informing me as a user how to continue and how to help the project even further. Now, for my very first contribution that went out to a JBoss project, what I got was a mention, a thank you in the JIRA issue, in the commit, in the release notes. Why on earth is this helpful? I could take this public thank you, go to my manager and tell him, hey, we made a contribution and it's being made public there. He could take that, go back to his customers and say, hey, we are very active in the open source space. And suddenly, 
more people in our company got time to contribute back to open source. So this is the reasoning behind giving a public thank you. What else works, at least at the Apache Software Foundation, is that people will give you increased influence and increased ownership. Remember back the project management committees, those are the people who decide who else to invite as a committer. This will typically happen if you remain committed for long enough. Now, we've done a survey at Apache on what does the Apache way mean to you. And something, some quotes that I like was this one. <laughs> I hear very often that contributing to open source is, is kind of a the sharing is caring. Now, if you remember how this web server was built from people who had a business case themselves, it actually boils down to get gaining by sharing. It means banding together across boundaries, across organizations, to build something that's bigger than anything that you could have built on your own. If you stick around long enough, that's easy, me standing here 15 years later, it also means building an awesome network of people across geographies, across organizations, who meet not only at conferences like here, but also who exchange technological patterns, but also like stories from, from their um, work experience. So you get to benefit across all of those communities. Now, the funny thing is that this influence, this kind of influence, doesn't go away. Merit doesn't go away. Why is this important? Clearly, you can take a break. That's what I'm going to do two days from now, going on a vacation for three weeks. I'm gone. I can return. All good. What's more important, though, if you are contributing as part of your day job, fixing problems that you run into, it's fine to be there very active in January not be active in February, March, April, and then become active in summer again. Even if you switch jobs, your committer status goes with you. So if three years, three years ago I was very active, I went to a job where I cannot be so active anymore but because it doesn't align with business goals anymore, I can switch jobs five years later, return back to where I was except that technology may have continued and evolved, but my status remains. Now, Apache talks a lot about volunteering, about things not being paid. Does that, does that mean that everyone is contributing after hours? We've seen the hands right here in the beginning. That's not true. While the Apache Software Foundation itself doesn't pay for software development, that doesn't mean that these open source developers aren't being paid. They are paid by entities who are, who are interested in furthering the projects that they, they have experience with. So it doesn't mean that all of these people are behaving in an altruistic way. What the ASF expects is that you act as an individual. Is this easy? Nope. So let's dig a little bit deeper into why people are being paid to work on open source. And maybe you can take some of these um, reasons back to your own manager in order to explain why you should be the one to contribute back, to take some of your time to work on the projects that you hear about today and tomorrow. It starts with the e really easy even before using any of the projects that you will hear talks about today and tomorrow, you want to take a look behind the scenes. They are being developed in the open. If before you make a decision before or against a dependency, you want to know how decisions are being made. You want to know who owns the project. You want to know how trademark issues, IP issues are being dealt with. You want to know how security issues are being dealt with. For that, in order to learn that, you will have to spend some time researching that project. Once you've got it in development or even in, in production, you want to learn from the experts. 
Much like I subscribed to the Nudge development mailing list back in the day, you want to subscribe to your favorite project as well. You want to want to learn from these experts. You want to learn also from the users and want to avoid making the same mistakes. You want to get in touch with those who are actually working on those projects. That way, you can extend your team's knowledge beyond your own organization. And there is something important. You will learn not only the technical skills, over time, you will also gain leadership skills. Leading discussions on these lists, getting people aligned behind one goal. Now, for every single open source project that I've used in the, in the past, there was always something that didn't sit quite right. Documentation may have been wrong. Some implementation may have been not quite right. So it's very quick that at some point you will um, start working on a patch. Why should you contribute this thing back? You can keep it in your organization. You don't have to polish it. You don't have to make it more um, reliable or more broadly applicable. What you gain by contributing it back is A, you don't have to pay the maintenance cost. Next time you upgrade, your patch will already be integrated. And those making modifications will have to take it into account when making refactorings. But also, for one of my patches that I sent to Apache Tomcat, actually, what I received was valuable feedback on the limitations of the changes that I had made and how to make it better such that it applies in a broader scope. So some things that I changed would have broken in production, except that the actual developers helped me improve the patch. Of course, if you're running a consultancy, it also helps you gain street credibility. So you participate actively. You help out. You are visible, like with my first patch to uh, the JBoss project. So you gain street credibility that you can show others. Nina already talked about our sponsors. You get visibility, and that helps with employer branding and recruiting clearly. If you remain active, at least at the Apache space, what you gain is influence. You can help navigate and steer, steer where the ship is going. But referring back to the quote I gave earlier about the gaining, is, uh, gaining by sharing, what open source enables you to get is to collaborate on a project to grow beyond what you, your, you on your own could achieve. You work together with both friends and comp competitors on a project to build something that each single one player wouldn't be able to create. And with that, you will innovate much faster, you will move much faster, but you will also build something that's sustainable on the, in the long run. So to some extent, the communication on Apache list is, has a bad reputation for dragging for a long time because it's very consensus-driven. But pulling all of these people around one table means that you have a sustainable community that can carry on over decades. Why does it help us well to contribute back? It helps with pushing open standards in order to, if you help improve the tooling that supports those standards, um, more people will be able to adopt them. Of course, it can also help to further projects that serve as like candy for users to use your offerings. Now, Apache remains the Switzerland of open source. The idea is that you interact and participate as an individual. With so many people being paid there's a lot of head switching going on between being board member and committer, between being employee of company X and PMC member. What helps is if people make that head switching explicit. This is a little anecdote again from a keynote here at Berlin Buzzwords. 
It was about Hadoop, C Hadoop ecosystem, and about C Hadoop community. The person was giving a really nice keynote about the current state of affairs and where things were going. Except that the audience was very skeptical. Turns out, what this person had done was to use a slide deck from his company. He wasn't talking company issues at all, but people were skeptical because it wasn't clear which hat this person was wearing. Going forward, this was being made explicit at the beginning if the person was speaking for company X or for the project. And this helped very much and made it very clear um, what message people were expected to receive. So Apache doesn't pay for software development. Someone once said you pay with time and love. What I mean with you pay with time and love is you can't pay your way into the foundation. You can't pay, pay for a seat, board seat. You can't pay for someone to become a committer. However, you can pay with your employee's time. If someone is a committer, you better retain them. Because they will take their committer status with them if they switch employers. There's one warning, so. Make sure that you do not pay with your physical health. We did have a keynote here a couple of years ago in Postbahnhof from someone talking about the negative effects of being a software engineer. Make sure to watch out for yourself. Same goes for mental health. There are even more subtle side, side effects if you put too much time and love into open source. There are some links. Oh, you can't see this due to these funny balloons. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a link as apache.org slash volunteeritis. Even if you just Google for volunteeritis, you will find it, which warns about not putting too much energy into your open source project beyond what's healthy. And that's very easy to say. So you pay with time and love, except when you're not. What does the foundation pay for? It pays for infrastructure machines, for people working on infrastructure, for press, for legal, for travel support, for um, trademarks work. Anything else I've forgotten? Nodding heads? <laughs> OK. So how do we pay? We pay through donations and sponsorship programs. Give us all your money. Talk to fundraising at apache.org if you want to support the foundation. What's interesting for me, as someone who once was a user, now I'm a member of that foundation, so is that you are not alone on that journey. Through its focus on neutrality, Apache manages to build bridges across organizations. To, it manages to bring people together. And often, the issues that projects are facing today aren't new. So there are people who, around who know what to do or what worked in the past. You just have to make them speak. <laughs> and speak in a way that you understand it. So there's a lot of best practices um, related to project governance. Um, currently, the foundation is working on making it clearer which pieces of the governance structure are based on which experience. So it's nice to work together to meet in person. We are going to have an Apache Con later this year in Berlin. I believe hosted right here. Yes. Just come back here in a couple months. Um, there's many other conferences that you can go to. The funny thing about Apache is that they also have links to other open source communities. Think OpenJDK, think Debian, think Docker, think WC3, and many others. Serious experience with dealing with poisonous people, like if everything is public, sooner or later you will have people that don't fit quite with your community. There is a nice talk that I am not going to go deeper into by Brian Fitzpatrick and Ben Colin Sussman on dealing with poisonous people. Um, my recommendation is to watch it. But really, if anything feels overwhelming, don't be afraid to call that out to ask for help. So to summarize, if you want to contribute and you don't want to do this after hours, go to your manager right now, tell them about the advantages, 
both for yourself, but also for the team and for the company. And for that, I would like to invite you to join both development and user at whatever your favorite project may be. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Any questions? Otherwise, go for coffee. I'm standing between you and coffee. <laughs> okay. I'm going to be around today and tomorrow. If you do have questions, just ask. Thank you. <laughs>